But you may not know, I actually, I used to work in junior high. Um, I, I used to be a junior high pastor. So let's see, 2003, I don't think any of you were born yet. In 2003, I started my first day at TNL, and it was the same day that they had just hired a brand new junior high pastor. His name was Travis Seibert. So Travis has been the junior high pastor since 2003, which is, geez, it's been so, so long. Um, and uh, that year, well, might have been next year, there's a movie that came out that changed junior high and youth ministry, like, forever. It was a movie called Dodgeball. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I don't even know what it's rated, so I'm not recommending it to you. But prior to this movie coming out, we would play dodgeball sporadically at best. We'd play from time to time. But after this movie came out, it swept the nation. We were playing, like, geez, every other Tuesday night. Um, the leaders were playing. The guy groups were playing. The girl groups were playing. It was this crazy thing. And um, the college ministry at the time, they started playing on Wednesday nights. <clears throat> so I'd play dodgeball on Tuesday night at TNL, and then I'd come back to church on Wednesday night, and I'd play. And it started with, like, 10 guys. And a few weeks later, it was, like, 50 guys. And then it grew to 100 people. And then um, girls would come and play, and some would just come and watch. So we'd have, like, entire audiences. Uh, within a few months, there were so many people coming to North Coast to play dodgeball that we had to separate. We had to play in different rooms because we'd have 300 people playing dodgeball on any given Wednesday. And so the solution so that we could accommodate all these people was we, s we decided we were going to host a tournament. So it was teams of six, and so you only played a few times throughout the evening, and then as the weeks went on, the winners would play the winners and all this stuff, and there was this cash prize. And I was on a team with Travis, a couple other guys who were um, serving in the uh, junior high ministry, our team was called the tie-dye tough guys, and we made our own jerseys, so imagine six grown men making tie-dye shirts and putting them on, yeah, and we won. We won the tournament. We were like these little, like, local legends, like, oh, the North Coast tournament, we're the best, and it was this amazing feeling, because um, I wasn't super popular, didn't have a lot of friends, and in front of, like, 300 of my peers, uh, we won this tournament, and felt really good, and people were talking about it at college group, and people were talking about it on the weekend, and then within a few weeks, that feeling of, of accomplishment and satisfaction, it kind of waned, so I wanted another tournament to come around, right? Like, I wanted to feel that feeling again, and we won some more tournaments, we lost some more tournaments, but I remember this one Wednesday night, one of my buddies came up to me, and he said, hey, I found a bigger tournament. There's actually a California tournament. You have to pay 40 bucks, but you drive up to L.A., and you play other teams all throughout California. And if you win, you don't just get a cash prize, but you qualify for the national championship. So we went that year. We rounded up, like, the best guys out of our North Coast 300 guys. We had, like, tryouts and all this stuff. Drove up to L.A., and we won the whole thing. We went undefeated. We didn't lose a single match that day. I played dodgeball for, like, eight hours that day. I was so sore. And we became the um, California uh, dodgeball champions, right? And so don't clap for that. It's not a big deal. So the feeling's back, and it's even better now because now I go back to North Coast, and I'm like, guess what? We're the best dodgeball team in California. California's a huge state, right? That's a big deal. And, again, people were talking about it. It was exciting, all this stuff. But inevitably, the feeling kind of went away again. And so I set my eyes on the national championship. I'm like, all right, if we win that, then I don't have to play another game of dodgeball. We'll be the best in the United States, right? Like, bring it on Hawaii, bring it on Alaska. We're the best, right? And so we uh, go out to the national championships. We won the national championships, right? Look at this. Wow, this is a heavy trophy. So we come home. We're in the newspaper. I save the clipping. I have it laminated. Everybody's talking about it. Oh, my gosh. Hey, are you the guy that's on the national championship team? Yes, I am the guy. Da -da 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 -da. All this thing. And here's the problem. The, the, the feeling it lasted longer this time because there was more excitement and it was a bigger deal, but inevitably it faded. And we're like, what's the next tournament? What are we going to do? We, because we won the national championships, we actually found out that we had qualified for the World Dodgeball Championships in Las Vegas. So in 2005, yeah, this is a true story. In 2005, we drive out to Las Vegas. We compete in the World Dodgeball Championships, and we got third place. Dang, wouldn't it have been awesome if we would have gotten first? We got third place, but third in the world, which is way better than best in the U.S., right? 
So still, we come home. I'm on the phone. It's really exciting. This time, we made it on the news. Local news, like San Diego Channel 8, was like, did you know that uh, right here in our own backyard, this team of, you know, whatever, I don't know. doesn't matter. But I'm like, okay, this feels good. Like, the feeling is better because we're um, third in the world. But pff, a couple weeks later, what happens? Nobody's talking about it anymore, right? Like, and there's no Instagram at the time, and I think everybody was on MySpace, which wasn't nearly as big as Facebook. Ooh, this guy just cringed at MySpace. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's like, it's like, ah, uh, how do I capture this lightning in a bottle, right? Like, I keep feeling these moments of, of amazement, but it's not sustainable. So we go back. We go back in 2006. 2006, we win the whole thing. Dodgeball world champions. Look at this. This thing's bigger than I am, right? Dodgeball world champions. This now game changer. This, okay, this is, it doesn't get better than this unless we make a rocket ship and we, like, fly out to the moon and play the Universal League, right? So we come back. We make, I came home with $6,000 we won at the Dodgeball World Championships. Yeah, my life is like forever changed, right? They wrote an article about us in this magazine, and they flew us out. There's this huge conference, 10,000 people. I've got a video. You can watch it. They, they fly us out to Alabama because they found out that the Dodgeball World Champions all attended North Coast Church. So we go out to this um, conference. It's called the Catalyst Conference. Um, and they have us, the six of us, the world champions, they have us play, you'll see in a second, we played against the entire audience, which is 10,000 people. So this is us. We lose pretty bad. You'll see. We're about to get destroyed by um, 10,000 dodgeballs in just a second. So they fly us out there. Um, we're, we're like, the, the celebrity status at this point, it's not like local anymore. Yeah, look at it. Bad news. Woo! There we are. So this is, I think, this is 2006, uh, and we're the champs. That's me. I just threw the ball. I'm about to, like, trip or something. Anyways, you can cut it. Um, I don't know. I was, like, 21, 22 years old at the time, and I come back, and, um, like, I think my life has changed forever. So I'm not even... I'm not even, like, at North Coast. We're running these tours. We're going to different churches, and we're talking about how God has worked in our lives and how we want to give God the glory and all this stuff. And, like, it doesn't get bigger than this, right? And so the feeling, it doesn't go away this time. It doesn't just last days. It doesn't just last weeks. It, it goes for months. You know, people are still talking about, oh, my gosh, you're a dodgeball world champion. But inevitably, we, we won in August. By the time December hits, I'm like, what's next? So we go back in 2007. Uh, we won the co-ed tournament, but we, we got, like, fourth place in the world championships. We go back in 2008. We win again. Two-time dodgeball world champions, right? Like, I have to keep chasing this feeling. And um, in 2008, I was dating this girl who's now my wife, and I was so excited to come home and tell her because um, we were in a great relationship, and I thought, okay, she'll understand. She'll be the one that respects all this hard work, and she'll be the one that can kind of help me perpetuate this feeling. And I come back, and I go, babe, we've won. We're two-time dodgeball world champions. And I was expecting her jaw to just hit the floor and be like, oh, my gosh. And she goes, cool. And that's when I just realized <sighs> I would have to win this tournament every year for the rest of my life in order for me to sustain this feeling. Like, I was just chasing after this 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 desire that, like, for sure it felt good. And we did work hard. And we were a team, and it was a good feeling, but it, it would go away. It's the same reason Brady's going to have, like, 20 Super Bowl rings by the time he's done, because he wins the Super Bowl. He's the greatest of all time. And within a few months, he's like, I need to feel that again. And, and that's kind of what we're talking about today, this idea that maybe we're chasing the wrong things. And it's something that when I say it, you nod your head and you go, oh, good point. But you also know it. You kind of intrinsically know it. Like, have you ever played that if you were stranded on a desert island game and you can only bring one thing with you, like it's a book or a video game or a movie? And that's a hard game to play. Why? Because you know no matter what you pick, even if you have a favorite movie, like your favorite movie's here and then second's like all the way down here. Even if it's your favorite movie, your book, your video game, whatever it is, you know it's eventually going to get boring. It's going to get tiresome. That's why they make sequels. That's why, like, I would say one of the best video games of all time is Super Smash Brothers. But I bought the first copy in 1997 before any of you even existed. Why did they need to make another copy? 
Why is there a Smash Brothers on GameCube? Why is there a Smash Brothers on the Wii, the Wii U, and now on the Switch? Why will there inevitably be another Smash Brothers? Because even though it's like bottled video game perfection, it can't fully satisfy us. It can't. And that's because you're wired, you're designed in such a way, God made you in such a way that you're supposed to get only addicted, find only satisfaction, contentment, peace, joy from Him. There's like this God-shaped hole in our hearts and we go out and we start chasing after other things that inevitably, like, I, I'm not even kidding you, this trophy's broken, I don't care. They just sit in my attic. I, they, they're not even up on a wall in my house. Like, they're meaningless to me at this point, except in that I look at them and I go, wow, look at what I used to chase after. Like, look at, look at how I used to define happiness and success and contentment. And my wife doesn't give a rip. My wife is like, do you love God? Do you love me? Or do you love our kids? Those are the top three things. It doesn't matter how much money I make or how good I am at dodgeball, which I'm not very good anymore. It's been 10 years. I'm old. I get really tired really easily, right? I jump now, dodge a sweet ball, and I accidentally let out a fart because I'm old. You know, like, this is my life. It's unavoidable, you know? And so it's like um, this, is, this is what life offers you, okay? Any Pirate's Booty fans out there? You guys like Pirate's Booty? Pirate's Booty is really good, isn't it? I, li I like Pirate's Booty a lot, but if you look at the, like, the, nu the nutrition facts, like how beneficial this is to your body, this entire bag has like the same amount of calories and, and, and protein as like one egg. And, and, and when you snack on this stuff, you can eat it all day, can't you? It's like flavored air. Like you, you can eat this and get to the bottom of the bag and this, this, you just ate like puff what's the, uh, like, puff dust, right? Like, there's almost no sustenance in this bag. Does that make it bad? No. If this is your favorite snack, is that a bad thing? No. Snack on, my friend. But what if, no, I'm going to eat these later. I like them too. What if, maybe I'll give them away. We'll see. We'll see how, how we'll see how well behaved you are. But if you told me, you know what? I love Pirate's Booty so much that I'm actually only going to eat it from now on. So instead of having like a well-balanced meal for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you say, I'm just going to eat pirate's booty. I'd say, you know what? That's a really bad idea because in a few months, you're going to die. Okay? And in a few weeks, you're going to be insanely constipated. All right? You're going to be full of popcorn kernels. You're going to explode into a cloud of your own poop, right? Like, that's your life, you know? Like, bad idea. And so I'm not inherent. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm not saying, like, whatever you're chasing, maybe it's social media. Maybe you're like, hey, I'm just, I posted this post one time. And it was so good. So many people liked it. And, and uh, so many people commented on it. I want to get that feeling back. I felt popular. I felt meaningful. Or maybe it's a, a video game. Or maybe it's an app that every day you open up your phone and you have to go back to this thing. Whatever it is you're chasing for satisfaction. Maybe it's um, your popularity at school. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's... Um, an achievement, an accolade, to be more athletic, to be more this, to be whatever it is, ultimately, those things may not be bad, but if you replace them as, your, as the sustenance for your body, you're killing yourself. And so it, here's what I want to talk about today. We're going to wrap up the book of Philippians, and we're in this series called No Matter What. I, I want to tell you, this isn't on your note sheet, but you might want to write it down. No matter what, the world will never satisfy you. It can't. There's no amount of money that the world could throw at you. There's no amount of achievement. Look at your favorite celebrity. Have they stopped chasing the things that they've been pursuing for their entire life? No. Every, every grown-up, when we get a raise, we go, yes, finally, now I'm content. A couple weeks later, what do we need? More money. We need more friends. We need more followers. We need more this, more that, da 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 We're going to look at Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to see a man named Paul Talk about what it looks like to, to find the, the right ingredients for, for the meal that sustains our body. What does it mean to find biblical contentment, that word, that you actually find peace, joy, sustainability. And so I'm going to open up to Philippians chapter 4. Here's what I want you to do um, as I read this passage to you. I want you to remember and understand that Paul is penning this letter from prison. Okay, that's a big deal. So as I read this, I want you to think, this guy, this man, he's rotting away in a prison cell. Okay? Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, I will start. He says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me, which is an interesting way to open a paragraph 
that you, in a letter that you write from prison. Like if I was in prison and I was writing you a letter, I'd probably open with, prison sucks, exclamation point. But he, he says, I rejoice greatly that you've renewed your con- concern for me. He's talking to the church of Philippi. He says, indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content. You might want to underline this. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That passage, uh, verse 13, it might say in your Bible, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is the most ris- misrepresented and misquoted Bible, uh, Bible verse in your entire Bible. That verse right there, like they've run studies on it. That is the most misrepresented passage in your entire Bible. Here's why. If you pull it out of its context, if you rip it out of the jail cell and you rip it away from Paul talking about contentment, it sounds like as long as you remain in Christ, you're a superhero. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. People have misquoted that so many times. I've heard it like misquoted when someone's about to do a really big thing or somebody's about to do something dangerous. And people go, oh my gosh, why are you doing this? And they say, I can do all things through Christ who can give me strength, right? Like you've got this snowboarder who's like, I'm going to jump that gap. And at the bottom of that gap, there's like poison alligators. Oh, also, I'm going to light my hair on fire. No, really? Yeah. And my snowboard, it's made out of Swiss cheese. See ya. Right? And they're like, how are you going to do this? How are you so brave? And he's like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me. Ah, and he gets eaten by an alligator, right? Like, that's not what that passage says. Don't go to school and someone, like, is picking a fight with you and you're like, I'm going to fight back because I'm a Christian and I'll win. No, you're probably going to get beat up, right? No, bad idea. Okay, this passage, Paul's saying this. He's like, I'm in prison. And he says, hey, I appreciate the Church of Philippi that they're looking out for me and they're concerned for me. Uh, But I don't need to be dictated by what they bless me with because I've learned how to respond when life is good. I've learned how to respond when life stinks. In other words, he's saying, I was a Pharisee. I was rich. I had it all. Paul had a really good life. And he was not swayed by his riches. He was a good steward of those things. He knew how to handle those things well. He didn't become addicted to those things. He didn't fall to those things. He didn't, he didn't pursue those things in an unhealthy way. And then he says, and now I'm in prison, in total poverty. All those things have been taken away. And I could complain. I could be upset. I could throw in the towel. And he says, but that also does not have to, to dictate how my life goes. And so what I love about Paul, we're going to see he's actually kind of bulletproofing his life. Like, he's creating a situation where no matter what life throws at him, he says, you can only hurt me so much because I have found contentment. I'm invincible to what the world throws at me. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time, and we'll go quickly. I know you have a lot of fill-ins. I want to talk about what it isn't, biblical contentment. I want to talk about what it is, and I want to talk about how to find it because I was 25 when I won this stupid trophy, 25 years old when I started to realize what really mattered in life and how I needed to pursue things, right? Well, you're significantly younger than that. If you can figure this out now, you'll be far and above, way ahead of me as far as spiritual maturity goes. So, number one uh, on your fill-in, biblical contentment is not happiness. It's not happiness because prison ain't fun, right? Paul's talking about how he's mastered it and he's rotting away in prison, Okay, so here in the, the definition of contentment comes from a man who's clearly not in a great situation. Now, you may say, oh, he may love to be in prison. Well, in the previous chapter, he prayed, hey, get me out of here. I'd love to get out of prison. In the same way that Jesus in uh, Matthew 26, I think, is praying that the cross be taken away from him. He steps aside, and he's under such duress. He's under such stress that he's actually going through this medical condition where his capillaries are breaking and he's sweating his own blood. So this is, and this is a real thing. This happens in like horrible life and death situations when people are under such terrible anxiety that their body's like breaking down and they'll sweat their own blood. This is something that Jesus is experiencing and he's, he says, I'm distressed. I'm far from happy right now. And he says to the Father, he says, if there's any way that you could take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. So he says, I get that we're dealing with the salvation of the entire world. If there's any other way, I would prefer that because I do not want to be crucified. I don't want to be tortured. 
horrible way to die. Jesus' entire life doesn't ever point towards happiness. And if you're here, or if you accepted Christ because you wanted your life to be easier, or you wanted to find happiness, I promise you, you're going to consistently be disappointed. That's not the point. Jesus didn't come to say, I'm going to make your life better so that then you die and that's it. He said, I'm going to come alongside and help you live this life in such a way that you find eternal happiness in heaven. It's like we have this terminal disease, and, and, and we, we don't want it cured. We just want it treated. We just, oh, I just want this life to be easier. Yeah, but then you're going to experience separation from God. In actuality, I'd much rather deal with the reality of this life and then have it be done with, paid in full on the cross. One day, I get to shed this broken flesh, and I get to spend eternity with God in heaven. Biblical contentment is not happiness. Number two, it's not a lack of ambition or drive. It's not a lack of ambition or drive. So I don't want you to hear, like, if you're excited about being a professional athlete or you have aspirations to do something really difficult that maybe people don't think you'll be able to do, I'm not saying, don't pursue it because even if you get this, it's meaningless and stupid. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, we see here that Paul is still hard at work. He hasn't lost his drive at all. He talked in the, in the uh, previous chapter about how he's actually running this race. He's, he's pursuing the prize. He hasn't slowed down. And here's the coolest thing is his job description, as far as advancing the kingdom of God, it hasn't slowed down at all. It's just changed. So he's in prison. He says, I don't want to be here. And then he goes, wait a minute. I'm chained to some of the most important people in the Roman Empire. Some of the highest guards are watching over me. He says, he's like, well, instead of being out there and preaching the word, I'm going to convert them. And I love how, like, Paul is so brilliant. The, the Romans, they're trying to shut him up, right? So they're like, Paul, you need to shut up because you're converting people to, to Christianity and we don't like it. So we're going to imprison you. And Paul says, go for it because then I'm going to convert your jail. And they're like, oh, crap. Well, then, Paul, we're going to kill you. And he's like, go, go for it. I'll go to heaven. Like, ah, ah, well, then we'll let you go, bozo. And he's like, fine, I'll keep preaching the word. Like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And, and that's what, like, if you can find that in junior high, oh, my gosh, that's my desire for you, that that life would just bear down on you, and you'd be like, life, what, go for it. You want to hand me this? God's good. You want to bless me with this? God's still good. You want to fulfill all my, my dreams? Great. God's still good. You, you want me to deal with incredible hardship? God's still good. Like, Paul has bulletproofed himself. Do you see that, he, do you see that his life sucks, and yet he's not affected by it? He's just getting after it. So, it's not a, a, a lack of ambition or drive. And number three is this, it's not laziness. So I, I don't want you to leave thinking, oh, I just sit around and let life happen to me and, and I try not to be affected by it. No, like there's, there's actually more that you can accomplish as a Christian when you stop being swayed so easily by what the world throws at you, whether that's good or bad, whether that's pirate's booty stuff or uh, difficult the reality of life stuff. If you can understand that you're a foreigner in a strange land, that you're passing through this life, you're going to be so much more effective. So let's talk about what it is. Um, this is kind of, I almost, I almost didn't put this as a point, but I think that you can handle it. Number one, biblical contentment is coping with what is and accepting what can't be changed. It's, it's coping with what is, accepting what can't be changed. I think some of you have maybe already dealt with this. Maybe something in your life, um, something like tragic or traumatic. Maybe you dealt with a loss that you realize inevitably will, will shape your future. Or maybe it was a um, medical diagnosis. Um, it could be a terminal illness that you or a family member or someone that you know is struggling with, and you realize, I don't know if we're just going to be able to pray this away. And I don't know if we're going to be able to just pretend this, this isn't happening. In the same way that Jesus is in the Garden of Geth Gethsemane and he's saying, yeah, I think this one is unavoidable, so I'm going to throw it up there, but, but God's will be, be done. And so it's this idea that, that to a certain extent, maturity is understanding, hey, some of this stuff isn't going to change. There's not much, much that, that we can do about it. Um, when I was your age, I'm not, I won't get emotional, but um, I was severely bullied as a seventh grader. It was horrible. Um, knife to my neck type stuff. Uh, 
death threats. I did this kid's homework for a year because um, his older brother was in a gang and they threatened to beat me up and kill me. And it was horrible, guys. Like, I remember my friends would say, oh, why are you doing Kevin's homework? And so I'd lie to my friends. Oh, he's paying me because I was so embarrassed and ashamed that I was doing this. Um, and my mom found it one time. And, you know, I, I had to lie to my mom about what was going on. Jeez, it was horrible. And I remember I just wanted to be bigger and tougher and stronger, and I've never been a big guy. Like, at, in high school, I was 4'11", I weighed 85 pounds, I was on the football team. Woo! Yeah! I'm 5'8 and a half on a good day, right? Like, and there's so much that I, I wanted to change, and I, it's just, it was life. It was the reality of things. Now, there's a lot in that situation that I could have changed that we'll talk about in a minute, but some of this is just understanding that um, life is hard. And uh, God never promises that he's going to fix it all. He promises that he's going to be with us through it all. Number two, it's learned, not acquired. And this is a principle that can be applied to so much of what the Bible has to say. Because when we read a passage or we hear about a Bible hero, we go, well, that's not me. Or you're like, Kirk, you don't understand. I'm, I'm addicted to this app on my phone. Or I'm addicted to this unhealthy relationship. Or I can't stop looking at myself in the mirror. I'm constantly trying to make myself more attractive. I'm constantly making myself more athletic, whatever it is I'm chasing after. Like, I have fully, I'm, I'm, I'm fully relying on this to sustain me, and I, I can't get away. And I want to tell you, anytime the Bible asks us to do something, it's something that we can practice and something that we can master. So don't think for a second that this is, oh, a spiritual gift that some people have and some people don't. Paul says, I have learned how to be content. And I would challenge you, maybe what you need to do is you need to take a step of obedience and say, God, I, this is killing me in my pursuit of this. I'm getting exhausted chasing after this pirate's booty thing. And I just need to trust that if I remove it, you're going to replace it with something better. And number three is this. It's putting our hope in heaven, our trust in God, and our eyes on the cross. Um, what I mean by that is if you put your hope in heaven and you realize that the finish line is not here on this earth, but it's getting to the end of this life. It makes coping with all these things a lot easier, right? Like when I can see that one day every tear is going to be wiped away and every right is going to be made wrong and injustice and mercy will reign in, in perfection and I'm going to shed my sinful nature, well then it makes it a lot easier to see a light at the end of the tunnel when I have a really, really, really bad day. Um, so, so let's close by talking about how do we get this? Wh what does it look like? What does it look like in junior high? What does it look like for a grown-up? How do we get it and keep it? Number one, change what you can and accept what you can't. So the last thing that I would want you to do is to go home to your parents and say, uh, man, we heard this really awesome message today from this guy who's super funny and super good looking. His hair is great. He's got wonderful fashion sense. Um, but he told me that if I'm getting bullied at school or if I'm dealing with something really hard, that I just need to accept it. I just need to learn to cope with it. No way. I made a huge mistake in not addressing that I was getting bullied because there were countless people in my life at that time that could have fixed that. And I'm very passionate today about people who get bullied. And if you're getting bullied, talk to me. Talk to Garrett. Talk to your small group leader. Talk to a parent. That's wrong, and that's something that you can immediately change. Okay? So, so think about the things in your life that you're suffering from that you have so much power to fix. Think about what's on your phone that's just eating away at your life. It's taking so much time away from your critical thinking. It's taking time away from your healthy relationships. It's taking time away from your relationship with God. It's taking time away from all these wonderful things, and it's killing you, and you're addicted to it, and you keep chasing it, and you say, I need more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it, and all you have to do is delete that app from your phone. And you know that you have that power. You're just afraid. So realize there's plenty that you can change and the things that you can't. Your height, your weight, your family situation. There's things that you can't deal with. You just need to get into the scriptures, man. I mean, there's so many responses to those things and learning that God made you the way that he made you and he put you in a situation that he put you in and learning to cope with it, which, which brings us uh, to the next one. Avoid your contentment killer. You know, there's, um, there were, like specifically in high school, there were relationships that I had that weren't necessarily unhealthy. But, uh, man, after hanging out with these 
guys, I would just feel like a loser. Like I just couldn't hang with them or I'd compare myself to them or, you know, th- they had this and I didn't have this. And if that's you, if you find yourself in situations where you're constantly comparing yourself to something or someone, limit it, right? Like don't give in to those things. Or if there's something that you're totally addicted to that you keep chasing, get rid of it. Like avoid the things that are killing you. You don't need to go off to someone else and say, hey, you should also get rid of this. Maybe they're not addicted to it. But you need to avoid the things that are killing you. I remember um, there was this game that came out a long time ago called World of Warcraft. And a bunch of us at church were playing it. And I got so addicted to that game. Oh, my gosh. A bunch of my friends didn't. And I finally had to delete it from my computer. I actually threw my computer away. Because I was like, enough. I can't anymore. They didn't. They didn't need to. They were able to handle it. They were able to say, this silly video game is a snack. It is not the meal of my life. And last is this. Treat every situation as a special assignment from God. If you can cut through the cloud of pirate's booty dust that so fills this life, if you can see through it and go, God, what do you have for me? He's going to be able to fill that God-shaped hole with himself. The Holy Spirit's going to be able to come in and say, time out. Let me show you what it means to be fully nurtured, to be fully satisfied, to be fully content. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, The compliment that you're chasing, okay, whether it's uh, how attractive you are or how talented you are or the achievement that you're chasing, whether it's on the field, whether it's on your computer, whether it's on social media, whatever that is, you'll get it someday. If you work hard enough, you will. It's not going to last. God is going to come in and he's going to say, here's my desire for you. I want you to have an impact on your campus. I want you to make a difference in the lives of uh, people who are older than you. I want you to influence your teachers, your friends, whatever it is. My challenge for you would be this. As soon as possible, pray this prayer to God. If you're brave, you can pray it quietly to yourself right now. God, how can I bring glory to you today? That right there is the heart of contentment and satisfaction. Because God's going to come in and God is going to say, you know what I want you to do right now? I want you to put your phone away because it's not going to satisfy you. Getting to the next level or beating the next level, whatever it is, it's not going to cut it. I want you to go home and I want you to respect your parents. What? That doesn't make any sense. How could I find fulfillment in that? Trust me. Trust me. I'm God. I know what I'm doing, right? Or God says, this is how I want you to respond to your friendships. Or this is how I want... Uh, you to react on campus. Maybe there's a kid that you always see that sits alone. You have no idea what it feels like when God calls you to something and works, advances kingdom, his kingdom through you. I promise you, the reason I'm on this stage sharing the gospel with you and not in Las Vegas playing dodgeball is because this actually means something to me. This sits in my attic and gets really dusty. I want to burn this image into your brain right now, okay? I want to burn this image of what the Bible, I'm 34 years old. I finally have it figured out. This is great. This is not necessarily bad, okay? If it's a sin issue, you need to get rid of it. If it's a hobby, if it's a pastime, great. Be the best football player. Be the best lacrosse player. Be the smartest person, great. But if you take that, and you replace what God has for you, you're going to kill yourself chasing after those things. Treat every situation as a special assignment from God. I'll close with this quote. It's a C.S. Lewis quote. It's really good. He said this, I would rather be what God chose to make me than the most glorious creature that I could think of and, and check it. I have a pretty wild imagination. I could think of some pretty cool creatures that I could be, right? Like, I'd for sure be able to breathe fire. And I would have praying mantis um, arms. So I could, because they are able to strike in like a fraction of a second. Boom! And um, I'd be able to fly. And I'd probably have laser eyes, right? Like, okay, so wh- in your wildest dreams, what does, what does success and significance and and being the best superhero, whatever it is. 
He says, I would rather be what God chose to make me instead of that. For to have been born in God's thought and then made by God is the dearest, grandest, and most precious thing in all thinking. This is a prayer of contentment. So if you could just remember, just remember that you are a child of God. And I'm, I'm 34. I'm a child of God. My dad is 67. He is a child of God. All right? At no point do you ever be, you become a grown-up in your spiritual relationship with God. And as a child, I can always go, even in my wildest dreams, I know that my Heavenly Father knows best. If you can get there, then no matter what life throws at you, you're going to be bulletproof. doesn't matter if you've got it all, you won't be phased. doesn't matter if you have nothing, you won't be phased because God is in control and you will be content. Let's pray. God, we, uh, we love you, and we don't just want to say that with our words. Um, we want to say that with our lives. And so I would pray right now um, that you would give these students the courage and the, uh, the encouragement to ask you what it looks like to find fulfillment in you, to ask you what it looks like to live for you and to serve you and to fulfill your purpose. And then I would pray that you would just speak very clearly to all of us individually in this room what that next step looks like, what it looks like in our relationships and what it looks like at school and what it looks like in social media and on our phone and all those things that we might actually find real satisfaction and contentment in this life. We love you, and we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.